Anybody want a free big bucks with Big Dave? Yeah. I'll need some helpers to pass them around. This is uh, probably a little, a bit of everything, but a lot of them are about 20 or about 20 of my best marketing ideas I ever invented over 20 years. They sell for 10 bucks, but today they're free. How about that? Uh -huh. That's good. That's good. Free is good, right? Yeah. Since you drove for two, three hours, you get it free, man. No need to get in depth on them. We're going to refer back to them a couple times during the next seminar to specific pages, but uh, uh, once in a while when you come up with a marketing idea and it's, and it's brilliant, you got to write it down, right? So I wrote down some brilliant ones. The 500 ones that failed are not in the book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, you know which ones I'm talking about. Cash register receipts and all that stuff. So who's the stayover from the first seminar? Got a one, two, three, four, about, about six or seven stayovers, and then the rest are shifting. New jokes. <laughs> now you're pushing me. <laughs> it's like burning the 20. You liked that one, didn't you? <laughs> that gets their attention, man. <coughs> Oh, that was in Baltimore. I, I, ignore Baltimore, would you guys? <laughs> Pretend it's Boston or New England. <laughs> I think we're ready to roll here. I'll look down the hall and see if anybody's going to straggle in, but if it is, we'll let them roll through. Yeah, we got a few. Come on. Come on down, guys. Sorry, it's 300, 400 feet. What's the difference between advertising and marketing? <coughs> I got time. Advertising is a function of marketing. That's very correct. Advertising, you know, if you look at the back page of Big Bucks with Big Dave, that's advertising. I'm trying to sell something. Got a couple of kids going to private college. You got to have a little cash or they're going to fail, right? <laughs> This is marketing right here because this is the story, and it's something that touches a customer. So anything that touches a customer is a marketing moment. And those marketing moments, we all have them every day. You'll have them here before you leave. You're going you're gonna to critique lunch. You're going to critique these seminars. You're going to critique this whole facility in your mind. And it may not be a, a, a function of your sub, uh, it'll be mostly subconscious. When we give it a grade, when you leave here at 3 30, 4 o'clock today and you put the key in the car and you start up and you start driving away, look in the rear view mirror, you're going to say that out of this whole day, you're going to say something good, something bad, or something neutral. This was a good day, this is a bad day, or this is a neutral day. And those three things, those marketing moments, are controlled by me, my partner, the facility, Pizza Today, and all that. We're controlling the outcome of what you think when you leave today. Hopefully, we're controlling it so you see something good. This was worth me leaving my store for a whole day. I learned something that I can take back that's going to make my life a little bit easier, better, different, profitable, whatever the case, whatever your motivation coming today is. When people come to your restaurants and they order your food and they put the key in the ignition and turn it, when they're leaving out of your lot, they're seeing something good, something bad, or something neutral. And that entire experience is, is controlled by your employees and you. Isn't this kind of spooky? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. The light stuff. It's your voice makes it like that. I seen a movie once like this. It scared me <laughs> to death. I had to go to the bathroom for a long time, you know? Oh, no, they're going to give them the chair, you know, and the light's dim. So anyway, consider marketing as anything that touches the customer. It can be your parking lot. It can be your glass. It can be your, naturally, your food. It can be how we answer the phone. It can be anything. That's a marketing moment. And they're, they're great or they're miserable. 
They're magic or they're ugly. Very few in, in tweeners. And normally, people determine how we as customers perceive that. I fly a lot. <coughs> a lot. Me and the old bags, they get, we get around. I'm a Northwest frequent flyer. And I probably have, I don't know, 250 or 300,000 miles banked. Bill Marvin has over a million banked. A million miles, he's platinum elite. We're special customers to Northwest. We, we know, every week we're on there buying three and four and five hundred dollar tickets, almost every week. Two weeks ago I was heading to, another, to, a, to a conference, I think it was Baltimore, and I wanted to bring some of these big bucks with Big Dave with me. Just for handouts. And you put 50 or 100 of these in your baggage and then put your baggage overweight. Because they give you 50 pounds for free. After that, they charge you 30, 25 bucks if you're overweight. So with me being a, an elite member, they give you 70 pounds before they dink you. I was 71 and a half pounds. She says, I'll need a credit card to charge you 25 or 30 dollars. I'm going. This bag is heavy. It's, it's a heavy bag. It's 71 pounds. So why don't we just pretend it's 70 pounds? And she insisted I bring a credit card out to charge me 25 more dollars because my bag was overweight. And I'm saying, well, it's the principle of it, isn't it? It's not the money. It's the principle. I said, so if I reach in and I take six of those things out, I'll be underweight. And if I put them in that briefcase because that's a walk-on, no charge, right? She says, that's correct. So what we have is we have a Northwest policy. And in your restaurant, you have lots of policies. I had a few myself. And 90% of all of our policies, mine and yours included, suck. Because they really piss off the customer. You all like getting policies? I hate policies. The policy of this bank is to do, 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 do. I don't want to hear your puke. Do the right thing. Make me a happy guy when I leave here so I like you, right? You see, there's policies and there's principles. All people have principles. And there's a big difference between policies and principles. If it absolutely has to be, that's not a policy. That's a principle. And one of the principles, as you'll all remember, is Patrick Henry. He said, give me liberty or give me death. That was a principle. That's something he's going to die for, right? Are you willing to die for any of your policies? No. They're just there to piss off the customer. Think about them all. And see what you can live without. See what you can be flexible on. And then get rid of the ones that are just because I'm in charge and it's my place. Because a lot of the little things we teach our employees today our employees to do to the customers are not necessary. They should be, have the freedom to make a one-on-one -on -one decision. When a platinum guy comes up to the scale and he's a pound over, go for it. Right? Do the right thing. I wasn't 20 over. I wasn't 10 over. I was one pound over or one and a half pounds over. Let your people sin and solve it now, right now in a case-by-case -case situation, and not drive me away. Question. Good question. Did you all hear his question? Yes. Did you guys hear it in the back? How do you encourage him and empower him to do that? The same way that anybody ever stayed at a Ritz-Carlton Hotel? I mean, these are nice. Five stars, right? As nice as it gets. Ritz-Carlton has a regular training seminar that you and I can go to for a week in Chicago. It costs us $2,500 as a non-Ritz employee to go to this five-day seminar and they teach empowerment to the 10th degree. The lady who cleans your room, the lady who pushes the housekeeping cart with a vacuum cleaner and a spray bottle, is empowered to do anything for the guest up to $2,500 without asking permission from the manager. That's a true story. Look it up. Ritz-Carlton Guarantee or Ritz-Carlton Google search it. You'll read this. The maid can go 2500 bucks. The desk person can go 5000 So when they ask you, how was your stay? Is everything, 
exceed your expectations, they really want to know. And if you say no, the water was cold in the shower, it's fixed. Why? They care. they care. They want you coming back next time, right? Instead of choosing another dozen other competitors. So how they do it at Ritz-Carlton, how we have to do it with our employees, is it's not natural to do this. See, it's not natural for us to just do the right thing for customers all the time because it's my place. I make the rules, you know? When you find employees that are doing this, you teach them, you tell them, you can, first of all, you tell them they can do it. Number two, when they do it, you praise them. And I don't think we praise our employees enough when they do the right thing. We're always there to criticize them when they do the wrong thing, but we're not there to, to praise them right. So in my store, we had something called like a goof pond. You all know, do coupons and flyers and stuff. Look in Big Bucks with Big Dave and see if you can find a picture of my goof pond real quick. It's in there somewhere. And then tell me what page it's on. <coughs> What page? Again? Page eight. page eight. Let's look at that goof pond. We, uh, we messed up about 3% of everything we did. And if you were totally honest with you, you probably mess up 2 to 3% of everything you touch. We're either late, we make the wrong pizza, we overcook it, we undercook it. You know, we just mess up. 2%, 3% is average. And when we did that, we wanted to know when we did that because I want to save you as a customer and not let you stray away. <laughs> Because the customer takes it personal when we screw their pizza up. They're paying good money for a good pizza, and it's not just right. So instead of hitting them with a coupon, we hit them with a goof pon. And the goof pon simply said, and you can read it to yourself. I don't have to read it to you. You know, sorry, we weren't right on target. Our only goal is your complete satisfaction. Please accept this goof pon and give us another chance. If there's anything we can do, let us know. And we, we, had it, we let any employee sign it for any reason. Didn't have to be manager signature. Now you're going to say, what if they abuse this, Big Dave? What if they're giving away the farm, right? That's our biggest fear. Well, the biggest fear is not going to really materialize because one or two people will try to give away the farm. You're going to catch those because, you know, they have a whole lot of coupons. But I can tell you that Hampton Inns invented the, are you, sh you know, it's called the room guarantee. If you're not happy with the room, it's you know we're going to make it right. And then all the other big chains did too. They adopted that that risk reversal thing. But less than. Two tenths of one percent of people go to the desk of the Hampton Inn and says, "Give me my room for free." It was a bad night. When we did the goof ponds here, all we're doing is damage control to our existing customers. <clears throat> they don't want you to give them the farm. They just want you to say, "Hey, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have happened. Next time, we're going to make it right." But normally, when that happens, you're taking that little note on the back of a piece of floating piece of paper. Customer Smith called on Friday night. We screwed up their order. We owe them a large pizza, right? You ever do that? And you write it on a floater? And where's that floater get hung up? With a thumbtack, maybe, on the, on, on, the, on the big board by the back room, by the time clock, maybe? And the next time customer XYZ comes in, they said, Big Dave said the next time I come in, he's got a paper hanging up that I get a free whatever. And the employees go back there, and they're looking for that piece of paper, aren't they? Can they find it? Hell no. Somebody ripped off that thumbtack, and they swept up that. And there you are in an embarrassing situation. You've got a customer who's at the counter who's looking for that freebie you promised them. You can't find the paper. They look like an honest person. And do you believe the customer, or do you just say, I'm sorry, man, there's no paper? <laughs> nah. So if you have this customer being in control of this goof pond, they're never going to lose it, are they? Never, because that's worth 5, 10, 15, 20 bucks. They walk in, boom, they deliver the goods. You, you honor it because they control that floater, you don't. So the empowerment thing is you've got to teach your employees that culture, because we all believe it as entrepreneurs. I'd say 95% of us in this room are here because we know that there's a lot of places to buy pizza, and the only reason we're going to be around another 5 or 10 or 15 years is A, continue to make great pizza, and B, out-service and outperform our competition with the face-to-face -face stuff, the service stuff. That's why we're all here. That's why I think you got up early this morning to drive here to learn a few little things and be motivated. But you got to tell your employees that story of what they can do and what they can't. There's a very famous story about the, the, the biggest retail chain in uh, the Pacific Northwest, a department store called Nordstrom. Did you ever heard of them? 
Nordstrom's department stores. They're not around here, but you go anywhere within from Seattle down to San Diego, you got Nordstrom's. They're like the Southwest Airlines. They're making money every day. You know, they're just the most profitable department store in North America. And this stuff ain't all that cheap, but it's really good. But when you walk in there, you walk into any Nordstrom's, I mean, you're not going to get in 15 feet before somebody says, welcome to Nordstrom's. I'm William. Is there anything you need at all? I know the store like the back of my hand. And you keep walking, because this is like, he's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, know, and you cannot cruise that store without having somebody saying, you know, they're not pushing to sell you anything. They just want to make sure that you walk out of there happy. That's a culture. They train you that when you hire in. You're here for one reason only, and that's customer satisfaction. They're going to buy the stuff. We just have to make sure when they leave, they're thinking good things. There's a story, and this is a famous story. It was written up by the American Management Institute because Nordstrom's won the Malcolm Baldridge Award for a retail organization on the highest award of customer service there was. Cadillac won it one year for, you know, and then, and then Nordstrom's won it. <coughs> and they have a, uh, their, you know what their company policy is? They have, one, they have a company policy. You can look this up on Google. Nordstrom's company policy. It's one paragraph long. It's two sentences long. Do the right thing for the customers. There are no other rules. Do the right thing for the customer. There are no other rules. That kind of says it all, doesn't it? But when you do the right thing for the customer at Nordstrom, you're recognized at their annual meetings and so forth because they got people doing really, really weird, cool stuff. And one of them was, and this story that's written up in the Malcolm Baldridge Award, is that a little old grandma came into the customer return service desk. You know, we all have been there to return the funky appliances we get that break and stuff. And this grandma come up to this stranger, and she was livid. She was hot. She was furious. And you can spot them coming into your store, can't you? You can smell them in the parking lot, can't you? Oh, boy, this is going to be an ass to you, and I can feel it coming on, right? Somebody screwed up, right? This lady comes in there and she slams down there and says, I've been buying stuff here for 55 years and I gotta tell you, this is the worst experience of my life. And, and, I'm gonna, and she starts ranting and going off on this guy and she bought four automotive tires. She bought four mounted and balanced tires on her car and they were all shot. I mean, they were so bad, they vibrated. She had them jerked off, put on new Michelins, and she brought her receipt back, and those four are out in the parking lot, and will they please send somebody to come out and give her a damn refund right now? Thank you very much. Ooh, guy got the receipt, 380 bucks, give her a cash refund, sent a zip out in the parking lot, and they rolled those four tires into Nordstrom's back door. Today, they sit in the, in the, in the boardroom of Nordstrom's corporate offices in Seattle. Four funky black tires are on the wall of this beautiful brass and glass place. Nordstrom's doesn't sell tires. <laughs> <laughs> never did, never will. Whoa. So this guy gave Grandma 380 bucks. Why'd he do that? Huh? Because in her mind, he was Satan. And she's going to tell everybody. Right? She's going to bad mouth. Now she good mouth Nordstrom's to the point where Tom Pease got wind of it and actually asked the story about the tires. And now half the world knows about those four tires sitting in the boardroom at Nordstrom's corporate executive boardroom. Because the guy did the right thing for the customer on a case by case business. There are no other rules. Now he could explain to her that the policy, and she wouldn't have got it. Because in her mind, you know, she might have went to Sears, I don't know, but I got a grandma, you got a grandma, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of a good joke, but I won't tell it. <laughs> well, that is not a but you said she had a receipt? Yeah. And no receipt, you didn't say no. No. It was just written up by a local car dealer. You know, he got off the funky tires and put on the new ones. And she wanted to be made right. That, that's not a very smart. No. <laughs> you tell me. 
You tell me. When you get a customer, though, that just complains all the time. Yeah. They want freebies all the oh, time. good question. What happens when you got the, the customer from hell, right? Yeah, you can never make it right. You ever Raise your hand if you ever had one of those. Enough, we're gonna give them free stuff. That's right. They're scammers, right? Yeah. You can figure these guys out. You know, 3%, I'll eat that. Yeah. But I can't screw up your order repeatedly because, number one, you're never coming back. Number two... After about the second time you, you verbally abuse me, I'm going to make it right, you know, because I don't want you getting, you know. And yeah, that guy comes in time after time saying, the last time I got food here, you screwed up the order, and I want you to make it right. And this is how you take care of those kind of people. And this happened to me several times. I want a large pepperoni and mushroom. We write down large pepperoni and mushroom. We make the pizza. We sell it to them. The next week he comes in, last week I got a pizza here. You know, I've been coming here forever. They forgot the mushrooms. Oh, I can fix that. We'll give you a pepperoni ham and mushroom, and the mushrooms are free. Yeah, we're cool. We're back to even. Sorry. Maybe I'll throw in a two liter, right? Okay. Next week he comes in. Same scam, right? Last week I was here. They're supposed to make a pepperoni ham and mushroom, and they forgot the ham. Eh. Right? So you might spend one more time and say, okay, that happens. We were busy. And you make it right. Third time he comes in, same scam, right? Here's the kicker. You want to fire the customer, but you want to have them save face. You just want to, it's like catching your teenagers lying. You got to let them save face, but stop the behavior, right? So what I would do is make his pepperoni, ham, and mushroom, right? And I would make him sign for it. Yeah, sign the ticket. Because I'm hanging it right up there with that thumbtack. You all have a great week. He saved face. He comes in next part. Is he going to try to scam me again? Uh-uh. He signed for it. It was perfect. As delivered, and the game's over. Occasionally, you get people that you could just not make happy. And it's not product. It's just them. Because you've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. And what I used to do is, I, in, my, in my 26 years of making pizzas, I fired five customers. Literally said, we're not making any more pizza for you. Anyone who works for me makes a pizza for you is fired. I can't make you happy, and it keeps, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night. You're fired. But to tell you how much I love you because I can't make you happy doesn't mean that Domino's can't. And I've got a $20 gift certificate of Domino's. I'll call Frank and let him know you're coming down. And I pass him off to my competition, who I hate. <laughs> He can go down there and pester the hell out of my competition for a year. He'll come back a different man, right? Or he won't come back. Either way, if, I'm, if I can only charge him for half you know, the food because he's always whining the other half the time, you know, I didn't lose anything anyway. But I'll send him down the road to a different person. I'll, give him a, I'll buy the first pizza on me. And they don't know what to say. Ba -ba 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 -ba. So don't, it's okay. It's okay. We try. We can't do it. Hey, Frank. Joe's coming down. He's been a customer of mine for five years. Just can't get it right with him. You've had a few of those. He'll be down the night to get a large pizza. Uh, get certificates on me. It works. If he comes back, he comes back a different guy. If he doesn't come back, he didn't lose anything because you've got to charge all the time to make money anyway. He's just trying to take it. There's givers and takers. And, you know, there's some takers out there. But once you identify them, call their bluff. Okay. That's enough for me. Anything that touches the customer is a marketing moment. Habit number one, and you've got them in your handouts, is make a plan of marketing and then work your plan. <coughs> have a plan and work your plan. Does anybody have a written marketing plan of what they're going to do in the next 12 months? Or are you much like me? I only marketed when I, my checkbook got to overdrawn. Oh, man, I got payroll coming up plus taxes, 941. So I better get out there and do some something to get some sales up, you know? Your competition's not doing that. You know, these chains and everything. Anybody chain affiliated here with major chains? Or are you mostly independents? Independents. Independents. Hip, hip. Chain? Independent. All right, me too. Don't like the chains. But they got a plan. They got little people that sit in little booths with little phones and little wires, and they make up plans for one month, two months, six months, and they know when their coupon drops are going to happen. They know when they're going to do for graduation. You've got a plan for your high school graduation coming up in four weeks? 
I know you don't. You'll think about it about a week before graduation and say, oh, we better do something for graduating. Because they go out a year in advance and they pick these key dates and they develop a little plan to sell an extra $500 worth of pizza for, or $1,000 for pizza for, for open houses for graduating seniors. Because they wrote it down. Valentine's, you had a great big kickoff for Valentine's? Your competition did. Because they have a plan. And you can Google search, you know, marketing plans and get all kinds of templates. You can buy books at Barnes and Nobles and, you know, just get a plan and just get a calendar and start writing in some dates on this thing. I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend this much money and I expect to have this much sales. Don't overspend. And we'll talk about wasted money too on marketing real soon, but don't overspend. But I know I could get the phone, I could get the addresses of all the graduating seniors in Oscoda High School. I know Mary Reitler, principal. I know Christine Beersley, supervisor. I got a lot of favors out at the school. Pretty good chance I could get all the, those things. And I would write a personal letter to the parents of Jason Ostrander. Dear mom or dad, congratulations on kicking one out of the nest after they graduated from high school. <laughs> we know that week's going to be really hard when, you know, companies coming and all that. Let big days be a part of bringing food over to your place so it's a stress-free situation. We offered three different options, option A, B, or C. Call and ask for Joe or Dave, work out a real plan for you. God, they love that stuff. We don't even talk money. We can do the pizza and the salad, we can do the, you know, we can do the deluxe, and we can do the whole deluxe deluxe. It doesn't matter to us. You know, it's seven, eight, or ten bucks a head. And we'll deliver every two hours or every hour. We'll leave, we'll leave our bags there to keep them warm, doesn't matter. But, you know, if we couldn't sell $2,000 worth of pizza on a graduation weekend, we weren't trying. Because all I got to do is get three, four, six moms to say, yeah. And out of 150 graduating, 200 graduating seniors, I can get three, four, six to say, yeah. If I ask them. If I ask them. And kids, when they come over for open houses, love pizza. Cold pot and pizza, that's, that's cool. That's very cool. They pass in a shrimp cocktail to eat pizza. Good pizza, my pizza. So have a plan, work your plan. That's the biggest mistake I see people having. I find that when I travel from coast to coast working with pizzeria owners, that most owners act like managers. They make pizzas and they supervise their crews on a daily basis. And they haven't developed a marketing plan with goals, objectives, timelines, and budgets. We're all guilty of it, me included, to a point, to a point where I was forced to do it. I was forced to do it. It's like towns after they had the fourth <coughs> fatal PI accident, they put a light there. You know what I mean? I was forced to be a marketing guy. I was a not a marketing guy the first 10 years. I was doing it all by luck and default. And most managers that I meet, and I'm not bad mouthing them because I'm there to help them. They only consider marketing of sales and cash flow are low. They want to jack it up. We've been, and then we drop down a little bit, then we drop down a little bit, and now I've got to work a whole lot more and I'm having a hard time. Now they really think about marketing whew, on a reactive instead of a proactive basis. And a lot of managers, and me included, spend a lot of money on strategies they know that don't work. And if I can get an amen, Am I the only one who's wasted money on advertising? You know when you write that check, it ain't going to work, don't you? But you got some smooth talking commission salesperson coming in there making you promises that you know are just fantastic, and I'm going to go for it, man. How much was that? 900 bucks. And you write the check, and they deliver the goods, and the results just suck. And you go, oh, wow. But we do it over and over. You know why? Because we don't want to do what they do. We don't want to actually own a promotion from conception to finish. <coughs> We'd rather farm it out to a, a commission salesperson that makes this ad that goes in the paper that almost gets zero results. Because that's work. And we, don't want, we, we want to make pizza. That's where our strength is. Man, we're born to make pizza. We love to make pizza. We don't like to go in the office, close the door, and actually have to come up with think work. That's hard. I'd rather make 50 pizzas and do my, my monthly books. 
So, we, you know, go ahead and job out to other people what you can't do yourself. But believe me, these commission people do not care whether your system, whether your whether promotion wins or loses because they're getting their paycheck. They don't care. They're not going to give you any guarantees it's going to work. Bad marketing is better than no marketing. Gosh, I asked, you know, what are you spending on marketing to a client? I spend it on 3% of a half million bucks, 15 grand a year. Well, let's just look at that 15 grand and see how we can better, you know, spend it. And you know that about half that is going to be for stuff that just isn't going to get any return on investment. But they've got the percent there. They're justifying their marketing, even though they know it's kind of crummy stuff. Ads and programs, yearbooks, chamber listings, these are not, yeah, it's not marketing money or advertising, it's donations. Anybody ever go to a, like, uh, well, probably not because you're still active pizza people. But, you know, your community theater does these little things, you know? Community theater, the king and I, and all that stuff. And you buy the half-page ad for 50 bucks. Because we know somebody that's, you know, and because we're a supporter of the town. Just know that's not going to bring you any sales. Nobody's going to take that home and put it on the refrigerator and say, isn't that great a big day to support the shoreline players? They can care less. But it's part of that community thing you do because you're there and you want to have your name there. But just realize it's not going to give you any sales. So that is truly a donation. Yearbooks, God bless them, I, was, I haven't missed one. But it's a donation. Those high school seniors, when they're 29 years old, go back there and look at all their locker. They're not going to say, boy, that big days was really cool for buying a half-page ad. They can care less. That's just the funding to, you know, get that book affordable for the kids. You know, Fraternal Order of Police. Am I the only one who's ever bought the decal? <laughs> huh? That sells a lot of pizza. Oh, there they are, right? You know, charities. God bless them. I love charities. But, you know, you have to be picky because, you know, you can go broke on supporting everything. It's called the National Begathon. And there's probably not a week that goes by that somebody with a good cause doesn't come in and want money. Right? Yeah. And, you know, they're all good causes. I never met hardly any bad ones, but we have to say yes to all of them or yes to a couple of them. So on charities, what we used to do is we had a thing called Big Dave Community Cash. And when you get the guy coming in on the National Begathon, like, hey, man, I mean, I'm an old Vietnam veteran, and I got this thing, and, you know, we're doing toys for tots, and if you write me a check for 50, he's like, right. We've all heard that, right? So what I do is I give him an application for Big Day's Community Cash. Love, to, can't give you an answer right now, but if you fill out the application and bring it back to me, we're going to put you in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the sort out thing, because we sort out and support all local charities, and I know you have a great one. But we gotta, we got to do a little bit of, you know, finesse in here. I want to know who you are, your mailing address. I want to know who's on the, on the board. I want to know their mailing address. And if I give you a contribution, where's the money going? He's never coming back. <laughs> right? That baby's in the garbage can before he leaves the dining room because he's not coming back. Now, the AYSO soccer people, they're coming back. Right? Because they're legit. This is the board of directors. You give money. You get to help this team you know, do traveling soccer games or help the refs get uniforms, you know. So be picky on who you give the donations to. And we just made them fill out a you know, real quick app. But half the people will never come back because we have to do a half-page app. Now, you didn't say no to them, did you? Love to give you the money. Why don't you take about 15 minutes, fill this little out there, we'll put you in the, and we, we, have, we, we draw money, to, we, 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 we get our disbursements twice a year. Now, if you're a legitimate nonprofit, you don't have a problem with that. And I've sat on a lot of legitimate nonprofit boards, and if it's United Way money you're looking for, you gotta you gotta wait your six months to go in the in the, in the you know Boy Scout Girl Scout cut. You know what I mean? You get your check. But the ones that need it instantly right now for whatever, you know, be careful on those because you know you're not. It's probably a scam or shaky. I was, my big charity in my town was the uh, Walk America. You know about Walk America? First Saturday in uh, April or May where all the mothers marched. It used to be the March of Dimes. We own that. In big days for like the last 10 or 15 years when I owned big days, I allowed my dining room to be places where the team members could all meet and have their meetings. And then that first Sunday morning when they did the march, I turned the whole building over to them from like 10 in the morning till 3 or 4 when it was done. 
And we raised in my small, small town maybe 10 grand in three or four hours. And that went right to you. The Mother's March would stay, 90% of the money stayed in my county for kids with birth defects. That was close to my heart. I knew, the, I knew the organizers, I knew the ladies, same ladies every year, and that, you know, it was a good cause. But when that, when those moms met and they started and they left, they used my building as a start point and the end point, because when they came back after they did their five mile walk with their pledge sheets, we gave them free soda and free, free slices. And just hung out in the dining room for an hour and they all cheered each other on and I let them use my office with the calculators to add up the money and, you know, it was cool. It was my once a year big thing for for uh, Walk America. Got plaques on the wall, got t-shirts, big days, Walk America, we owned it. The police started right there with the red lights and you know when they stopped traffic to let them cross the main Ranger Highway. We owned that. And what it cost me? Bringing in four or five employees for a couple hours and giving them a Sunday morning slow sales anyway, you know. Just let them have the whole building. But we had hundreds of people go through there and we just gave them a couple free slices and a drink. But that was community things, and it, it always paid back. So we want to do community things that have a little payback without costing us, and it was a worthwhile thing. So pick a charity you love, and then own it. After Big Day's own Walk America for seven or eight years, Kmart wanted to own it. Because they could see it's, it's a happening thing. Well, sorry, Dave owns it. You can bring teams down. Oh, no, let's move it up. No, Dave owns it. Until Dave says, no, you'll get set, you know, we, we continue to use Dave. So pick one you like, do it really good, and then own it. And then you can have, you know, you can be serving your community back. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of managers I know, they know what works in a marketing situation, but they just don't have the energy to implement. Unless I'm the only one, because I know... If I start working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and I got to open the place and close the place and do all the, the brain or stuff like ordering the food and making sure everything, I'm just too tired to think about marketing sometimes. I know what works, but I'm just too tired to go out there and implement it. Or I need to have some family time, so I'm going to stop marketing. And I'll give it to that commission person. Think about your P&L statement. You know, on your P&L statement, it has your income, your expenses, and your bottom line, right? Income, expenses, bottom line. Now think about your expenses. Starting up there, you know, they're all alphabetized from, you know, all uh, from advertising down to taxes or whatever. But look at, you know, advertising or marketing or whatever line item you call there. And then look at all your other assets. Look at your pizza oven, your mixer, your walk-in cooler, all your hard assets. All those hard assets you have don't make you any sales at all. Your pizza oven ever made you a sale? Your mixer ever made you a sale? Has your mixer ever made you a sale? You can't live without it. It's an asset. But the expense item, because uh, you know, mixer and equipment is an expense item, the only expense item anywhere in there that's going to make you a sale and bring you more customers is advertising. In marketing, good, solid, cheap, high return marketing advertising is the only expense item that's going to bring you more money. All your other stuff is cost of doing business. It's insurance, taxes, wait, all that stuff. That doesn't bring you any sales. Only this stuff right here does. And a lot of you folks know it works, but you're just too pooped to do it. I also think a lot of people, probably half this room has a POS system. Raise your hand with POS system. Raise your hand with this paper slips. About half and half. The POS people, one of the big reasons we bought that POS system is we were going to really market the hell out of our customers with that because we don't and we don't ever do. We don't use the system to its full capacity because that's work. Getting postcards and sticking them on things and doing little thinking, you know, creating all this marketing stuff is a hard, it's a hard job. We'd rather have somebody else do it for us. So what happens is all that data sits in that POS memory and we do not tweak it enough to get you know, to make it pay for itself, like we said we were going to do when we bought it. Any questions on habit one? Make a plan, work your plan. Just blurt it out if I went too fast over some item. Anybody got that? What you put on the application? What application would that? The, uh, what you have put down on the application? I want to know uh, the name of the group. You know, I want to know the legal, the legal name, not, you know, 
you know, I want to know, I want to know just the name of the group, their mailing address, the person who is applying for the money, who's on the board of directors, and where the money's going if I decide that I can help them donate. What percentage goes to the actual loan? Yeah, you can ask anything you want to. And then you have it signed by two people, and they bring it back, and that's how we legitimately decide. And that's a fair way to do it. It's not, you know, going, you know. You know, in small towns with, with less and less and less government help, you know, I'm a volunteer fireman. We're constantly underfunded. And we just, you know, we don't even care anymore, you know. We'll go, it doesn't matter if we have blowing out bunkers. We're going to go in there and fight the fire. And it was good when FEMA recognized that we were underdressed and underprotected because after they, they started kicking out some grant money, we got some grant money to finally come up to the 80s and 90s. But, you know, these poor townships and poor towns are so underfunded that cops walk around with, you know, and police and fire, we're all underfunded. Schools are underfunded. So pick the one you're going to fund, help fund, but you can pick the one you want to do and do the one that's closest to your heart. And do it well. In my store, we raised $3,000 for the fire department in one day, because I, like I like them over and out, bam. None of this can on the counter for six months crap, getting nickels and dimes and quarters. I wanted to do a celebrity fire department. We wanted to raise money for a, a water cannon. You ever seen those water cannons? In the, in the service, they're called deluge guns. And you hook in two huge hoses, and you crank up the pressure, and you can shoot three, 400 foot water straight. We didn't have one. We needed one bad. We have, an air, we have an airport we have to cover, and you can't get too close to burning airplanes. You got to throw a big pattern on it. And our township didn't have the 10 grand or 3 grand for the gun, so we raised it in one day. We had big days. Doing what? I told the fire department they could have everything over 500 bucks that we sold that day, as long as they provided all the labor and they delivered pizzas with the fire trucks. <laughs> and in uniform. So these firemen, and I'm one of them, went out and put posters from one end of the town to the other. Come to Big Dave's on Saturday from noon until 7, or noon until close, and you know most of the money goes to the fire department because we're raising money for this specific thing, this deluge gun. Well, we actually raised you know, probably 1,000 over budget. But they had my posters in McDonald's lobby. Because it's a feel good, ain't it? Nobody hates the fire department. Right? They had, my, they had my posters in Little Caesars lobby. It was over in one day. We had the money. We bought it. And guess who got the picture in the paper when we brought that gun in from Akron Brassworks? <laughs> I'm not a self-serving guy, but, you know, things need to be recognized once in a while, right? Who loves you, baby? Big days. Number two, get out of the kitchen. I'm going to get a new one of these as soon as I get home. You cannot implement a marketing plan with an apron on. It don't work. I tried. You can't do it. You can't do it. And the reason that most of us don't have huge surges in sales is we don't latch onto an idea and actually have that one or two hours a day of quiet time. Where we can actually think these things out and do another hour or two a week, three or four hours a week to go out and implement them. See, when I did that thing for the fire department, you think I just had the radio station do it for me? No, I had to think it out. I had to go to the printer and get the posters printed. I had to do all the little things, you know what I mean? Which is no big deal. I just needed time to do it, and I couldn't do it in the back room with an apron on being a pizza man. I had to be a manager. And I couldn't delegate that down to pizza guys because they don't know what to do with marketing. Only I do. You can't delegate it down. So if you're the owner, you're in charge of marketing, you can't give it to those pizza kids. I think you need to allocate about 10 hours a week to marketing. If you really want sales to grow, you can give it two, you can give it four, but if you can get yourself out of your store between one and three, five days a week, you're not going to be missed, number one. Between one and three or two and four, the holy hours when there's no sales, you're doing $34 an hour, get out of the store. Go start meeting the press. Go start you know, going from business to business to do cross promotion with businesses. We went. Every time you got your suit dry cleaned in my town, or an expensive piece, we had a poster up in the dry cleaners that says, Big Days, rooting your suit for loot. Say that, it sounds good. Rooting your suit for loot. When he opened up the breast pocket, pulled out the breast pocket, we had a, a bounce back thing inside the breast pocket on pizza. So it cost you five bucks or four bucks to get that dry clean. You might get $3 worth of food inside your breast pocket. 
route and you sue for, you know, we did things with the video stores. We did things with the gas stations. We did things with the oil change places. We had cross promotions going constantly to drive me to business and then drive them business. And you can't do that if you're in your restaurant with an apron on. You've got to go out and press the meat. If you're out of your store for about 10 hours a week, you can be replaced for about 100 bucks. One body in your store for 10 hours, <coughs> probably less than 100 bucks. Because all they are is just a body waiting to answer the phone and make a couple pizzas here and there, right? And if you uh, sold one pie a day, you got the 100 bucks back. And if you can't go out and sell one more pie a day, then you really ought to leave the business. If this was a 38 Magnum or 357 Magnum, and I'm all done with your excuses, and I said, I'm giving you 15 minutes to go get a new customer. Starting now. And in 16 minutes, I'm going to blow your brains all over the room. Would you be able to go out and get in one new customer in 15 minutes? Oh, yeah. You know where you're going? To wherever they are, aren't you? You're going fishing where the fish are. You're going to say, hey, come on down to my pizza place, man. It's really important. You come down and try me out, man. I mean, you've got to try me out. Quick. <laughs> Quick. It's called gun to your head marketing. If I put a gun to your head, you'd be out there kicking ass. But no, we're in our comfort zone. We're making just enough money to pay the bills, and we're cool. We don't have to go out there and get stupid and desperate. But you know your competition is? Competition comes to town, they have exactly zero customers. Zero. Who are they going to steal them from? That's why they're out there and they're doing the things that we should be doing. They're doing that 16 minutes, go bring me in some customers. So out there, they're knocking on doors, they're doing hand builds the right way, they're doing flyers the right way, they're, they're canvassing the neighborhood, they're making phone calls. They are desperate to steal your customers and we let it happen because we're in our comfort zone for about a year. Now they got about a third of our customers and all of a sudden, what went wrong? Whoa, man, what went wrong? I'm, I'm, I've got to work my butt off here. I, don't, I, I used to do that years ago. Believe me, if you give this job to commission salespeople, they'll smile at you and be happy to take your 100 bucks a week. Thank you. Ain't going to work. I love you. See you later. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you ever have a commission salesperson give you this great deal and you just turn it around on them? You ever turn it around on a salesperson like that? Radio or newspaper? Let's do this half page, four column. How much is that going to cost? That's going to be about 125 bucks. Cool. How much do you think that's going to bring me in? What? Well, how much do you think it's going to bring me in if I buy this half page or full page ad? Wow, oh, lots of money. Define lots of money. hundred pizzas? That'd be cool. I'd love to. I'll write, I'll write you two checks. But if it doesn't bring me in a hundred pizzas, will you let me have the ad for free? Because I'll track it. Because I'll put a phony phone number on there. Or I'll have, you know, I, I can track this. There's accountabilities now. They won't do it. Will they? But you'll write in the check. And they'll get your four customers for 100 bucks, or six, or seven. You ever do a radio remote like me? Isn't that a, that's a bummer, isn't it? Gosh, you ever do a radio remote? Was that ever a heartbreaker or what? You got this DJ just to jam it in your dining room and nobody shows. And then you got to write him a check for 400 bucks. What a bummer that is. And you know what? I had to do three of them before I figured it out. They just don't work. <laughs> Marketing is war. We developed a war room mentality on marketing because I had to. You know, in 1988, my, my place was ranked the 25th busiest in the country. April 1988. Pizza Day magazine, Big Day's Pizza, 25th busiest independent in the country. Man, I had a real ego problem. Oh, man. I knew I had arrived. All that hard work, all that, you know, sacrifice, I had arrived. I got five copies of Pizza Day from my mother like the Rolling Stone. My head got that big, I got an ego problem going on, and I'm just pumped, and my employees are pumped, and all of a sudden a weird thing happened. It's called Domino's and Caesars came to town within 30 days. Now, that wasn't supposed to happen. 
<laughs> they get the same magazine, don't they? And they sent their spies up, didn't they? What's going on up in Oscoda? Well, nothing. It's a small little town on Lake Huron. There's hardly anybody there. But they forgot to factor in Wurzmith Air Force Base. It's like a college, except they got money. They get paid instead of sending home for money. And that's where I was really rocking and rolling. So anyway, boom, within 30 days, I had Caesars and Domino's in my backyard. And do they have a lot more money than me? Oh, man. They're buying full-page ads every week. Every single week, they're doing coupon drops, and they're embarrassing me on price. And they're doing 30-minute delivery, and I'm doing within the hour. Whew, it got to be a little bit scary. And that's when I turned and learned how to be a marketer. It wasn't because I had to be beforehand. I was already living. I already had 75% of market share. I was living in a country club. I was driving to Lincoln's. They were going to change all that quick. So that's another seminar completely. But we had a war room mentality. I wanted to kill them. And we, we eventually drove Domino's out of town and crippled Little Caesars and took two more independents out. Because you can't have any, there's no, there's no mercy in this stuff. No one will ever weep for you the day you declare bankruptcy. My accountant told me that many years ago. They don't care. No one will ever weep for you the day you go under. So when you're thinking about, should I charge 50 cents for delivery or a dollar for delivery, or should I do this or should I, just remember those words. You go out, nobody cries. It's a hard thing to think about, but it's a true thing, isn't it? When's the last time you've lamented over a business going out of your town? I mean, really been, it lasts about a week. People just don't remember that stuff. So we're playing for keeps on this stuff. You either win a marketing war or you lose it, and there's no treaties. I would never befriend my enemy. He knew exactly where I was coming from. It was him or me, and I'm, you know, there's none of this. Let's have, let's talk it over over lunch stuff, you know. I hated him. And when, every time they did something, I one-upped them. Because it was just a matter of battling for my customers' minds. My biggest, one of my biggest problems is we didn't deliver very fast. And you may not either. Within the hour was what we said for 15 years. That's the Friday night. We're jamming. We got 30, 40 tickets up. We're within the hour. Sometimes an hour and 10. If the ovens are loaded and we're rocking, Domino's right across the street is delivered in 22 and 25 minutes. Every single order is 25 minutes to your door, 22. Did I lose market share? Of course. People sacrifice quality for speed. You do too or you'd never go to McDonald's, would you? Ain't the best burger, but it's consistent and it's fast. Domino's ain't the best pizza. It's consistent and it's fast. So people will bail on you for consistent and fast because they just don't have that extra 30, 40 minutes sometimes with the high paces our life cycles are with the kids and after school stuff and all that. They need it now. So we just beat them at their own game. Learned how they did it. They had all their pizzas pre-sauced, dough and cheese, you know, dough and sauce and cheese ready to go. Phone rang, they put the toppings on it, and they popped it in the oven. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. From 5 to 9 on Friday, I can keep 20 pies ahead, 30 pies ahead. I don't need to do it on Tuesday night. I can keep 6 pies ahead, right? Call, bang, in the oven. So Big Dave's did the natural thing, which would be 29 minutes are free. Yeah. 29 minutes are free. Who's got the fastest pizza in town? And we had to give away 5%. Oh, big deal. But we crippled them. Because we were always better. We just weren't faster. Now we were better and faster. And on Friday and Saturday, I had to have extra drivers in there, and I had to be really quick on getting them in and out and not dinking around. Had to streamline my system like they did, so it's in, chopped, gone. But I could do that because four years and four days later, they left. They went, you know, they sent the big flat bed truck up there and they put all their ovens and mixer and all their stuff and they hauled it out of there with a sign. Yes. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, right? Wrong. They're gone. And then I found the manager. My manager actually tipped me off because I was doing a seminar in Columbus. He called me. We didn't have cell phones back then. We had, like, voicemail. Remember voicemail? I checked voicemail. Hey, Jay, this is Joe. You got to call me. He doesn't ever say that. So I called Joe. I said, what's up, Joe? When are you coming home? So I'll be home tonight. 
Domino's is closing Sunday. <laughs> I said, are you bullshitting me? No. It's real. They're closing Sunday. Schedule's done. I got it firsthand. I said, wow. Are you sure? Yeah, man, they're closing. Because I promised Joe the day they close, I give him 5,000 cash. <laughs> and the day Little Caesars closes, I'm going to give you 5,000 cash. So Joe was a little big Dave. He carried his swords and his knives and his guns, you know, and he, you know, <laughs> he wanted them to close. So anyway, I said, Joe, I said, find a manager. He's not going to want to talk to me. But you're a lieutenant, and, you know, and he's a, and I want you to buy his phone number. Do a $500 cash paid out in the drawer tonight. Get the manager, get him out of his store and out of our store. Meet him in the parking lot and say, hey, we're really sorry to see you go. <laughs> but if you got to go, could you use 500 bucks? Because if you call Ameritech, and I call Ameritech and we're on a conference call, and you allow that phone number to transfer from your phone to Big Dave's building, I'll give you 500 bucks. But it takes his permission to do it. Because he owns the number, right? Joe met him, made the spiel, and the guy told Joe to give Ben. A week later, he called and said, Joe, I changed my mind. Because <laughs> the bills are coming in, right? Yeah, so we had their phone number, <laughs> fired into my building with two more extra phones, and guess what happened? You call him, he wouldn't get a busy, and, or he wouldn't get a disconnect. You'd get, Twing, thanks for calling Big Days, formerly Domino's. Can I help you? You know, because customers are the last ones to know, aren't they? They hit speed dial, they call their favorite pizza place. Instead of getting Domino's, they get Big Days. Was that worth 500 bucks to me? Yeah, because I dumped that line in six months. But in six months, everybody knew anyway. But we had an, oh, you know, $200,000 increase in sales because that phone got moved over, and that cost me $500. Along with, along with, you know what I mean? But, oh, well, play to win. You got to do reconnaissance. You got to know your customers, and you got to know your competition. Is you got to know all about them. See, I knew all about how Domino's did it. I knew all how I know. You know, do you have a customer competition that drives you crazy because they're giving away their pizzas for free, darn near? Yeah, is that a, that's the big thing, isn't it? How cheap can we sell it nowadays? Hot and ready, five ninety nine. Hot and ready, five bucks. You're probably not influenced with that around here, are you? I mean, but they have other chains that are doing. Two large pizzas for 10, 11 bucks, you know all that? What do you do to, what do you do to combat that? Or you just kind of sit over there and take it? And then, you know, the reason they're making money is they're doing that huge volume. They're not making hardly anything for pizza, but they're selling thousands of them. Because we've already established people who sacrifice quality for, for speed, right? I do, you do, we all do. So how do you get back customers and get that loyalty back? Or do you just give up? Inform them. Hmm? Inform them. Inform them what? Quality versus what they're getting and they'll give you Yeah. Deal. If I had a big reader board sign up on the road, I'd put these words. Cheap pizza ain't good, and good pizza ain't cheap. That's easy enough to remember, right? Because every time they buy those nasty pizzas, are they happy? <sighs> they're not happy. And they whine every time they go and plunk down the 10 bucks and get two nasty pizzas, but they keep on doing it over and over, and it's one of those marketing moments of misery, and they keep on doing it over and over. So what you've got to do is remind your customers that good pizza ain't cheap, and cheap pizza ain't good. When you're sick of bad, give me a call. I'm here. We don't fluctuate. And we ain't that much more expensive. When you really think about it, they've got these perception coupons going where they're not very far off you but it's all perception of reality not real reality when they do the math so you know I would I would create some messages just like you do and tell them tell them the story about your pizzeria you ever tell a story of your pizzeria to somebody how often you know you got a story don't you you got a story I got a story you got a story but we don't tell that story, do we? Not in a formal way, over and over and over. We all heard the story of Federal Express about this Marine pilot named Fred Smith, who was a Vietnam jock, 
and he went to Harvard School and he wrote a paper on how to do overnight delivery anywhere in the country with a fleet of dedicated jets and he got a C minus on his paper and he didn't get his master's degree. We all heard the story about Ted Turner, the guy who owns CNN, who was a complete jerk off in college. They threw him out of five places. We know the stories about these people a little bit. Why don't they know your story? Wouldn't take you but a 50 cents a customer and whole, you know, tell your whole story of where you're coming from, why you do it, what makes you different. Because that's the stories people remember. There was a guy named Claude Hopkins who was the grandfather of advertising. And Claude Hopkins, during the Depression, was in a high demand because whatever he designed a marketing thing, it worked for clients. And he did J.C. Penney, and he did this, and he did that, and he did that. And it was hard selling stuff during the Depression when nobody had a dime. But he was called out to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, about 1935, which is a long time ago. And he had to take a train, no planes. And he arrived in Milwaukee, and his client was Schlitz Brewery. And in Milwaukee, there was like 15 breweries. We know Miller, we know, you know, big home of lots of breweries. And Claude Hopkins is walking around with his clipboard, and he says, tell me all about your beer. What? He says, tell me all about your beer. Well, our beer is very different from our competitors because... The yeast cell that we use, the mother yeast cell that creates all the brewer's yeast, came from Germany in 1762. The same strain. We just keep them on perpetuating that yeast. Our water well that we have to go down to get the best water, we go down 4,400 feet for the cleanest water to make our beer. He's writing notes. And, 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 and they tell him the story of Schlitz. So Claude comes back, and he develops the Schlitz story. 4,400 feet. The mother yeast cell from Germany in 1760. Da-da-da-da, quality control, da 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 The brewer masters have been doing this fire brewing for 75 years, you know, generational secrets. He tells the story, and Schlitz is at the bottom of the pile, goes up to, like, number three in the country in about a year. They're doing 50,000 barrels. They go up to, like, 500,000 barrels. Why did that happen? He told a story. Can you tell a story? Why is your pizza sauce better than Papa John's? Tell me. Do you know what happened to her? Tell me the rest of the story. The rest of the story was their next campaign was to produce beer faster. Right, because... They brought the master brewer in, and he developed a program to create mediocre beer really quick. Right. Speak to the demand and they are in business. So that right. Was because they went from 50,000, which they control like us, to 500,000, and they, had no, they were over capacity. Maybe it was too good advertising, right? They grew too fast. And I've seen that happen. Where we went, kaboom, we were, we were not ready to handle it, you know? Once in a while, you get something that works really good, and you're not ready. Good rest of the story. But we can tell our story, can't we? Man, we could talk about those California tomatoes. We can talk about that cheese that we use. Do you know your competitors? Most of your competitors can't put mozzarella on their menu anyway, anywhere. <clears throat> Why is that? You use mozzarella? Who, raise your hand if you use mozzarella. Raise your, raise your hand if you use pizza cheese. Pizza cheese is not the same federal standards of identity as mozzarella. So in order to call a cheese mozzarella, you've got to meet certain federal standards of identity, and the chains go for the stuff with more moisture, less butter fat, because it's cheaper to buy water than butter fat and milk. And on their menus, you'll see cheese. And you go to their dumpster, you're going to see pizza cheese. It's still legal to call it pizza cheese, but in Velveeta can be called cheese food, but it can't be called cheese. Why don't your customers know that? They can taste it when they eat your pizza, right? What's different? God, tell them. It's those box toppers with the damn dollar, two dollars, three dollars off. Tell them your story on that box topper. Reinforce why they come back to you all the time. Why, when they stray, they always wish they could they would have ordered you instead of them because you got the best San Joaquin Valley, fresh, you know, full of fresh packed tomatoes instead of reman paste. You know, you got the best cheese. You got the leanest pepperoni. You make your dough by hand every day. You don't get it off a truck. Frozen like hockey pucks, McFrozen dough balls. 
You know, you tell them about that love. You tell them about that passion. And your roots are here, not your branches. You don't send your franchise money a thousand miles away. It stays here. You reinvest it in the community for Deluge Guns and for Walk America. You don't tell the story, they're not going to hear it. But if you start telling the story, they're going to start buying on. And then you start getting something called customer loyalty. And when you get customer loyalty, they'll never switch. Satisfaction doesn't work anymore. That's the, you know, when I come to this place and I plunk down 100 bucks for room, satisfied is the least common denominator I got to be. I expect satisfaction 100% of the time when I'm playing my heavy money. I want loyalty. I want the Northwest loyalty, so it's every time I buy a ticket, the first place I go to is NWA.com. Instead of Orbitz or Travelocity or Continental, I want loyalty. And how do I get that loyalty is I make people feel a little bit better and I tell them my story. I'll help you write your story. You, you can write your own. I'll give you the basic format. It's simple. But we all got a story. We don't tell it, and it's a secret. The Barbagallo family has a story. Colony Foods has a story. The dream, the coffee table, the kitchen table. They got a story. Man, you got to tell that story. That keeps them different than the Cisco's. And the uniqueness is what it's out nowadays. We got to be unique from our competition, or else it's just food. Well, it's food and passion. It's food and service. Because we all sell pizza. Buy from me because these are the reasons. And if you won't tell your story, your competition certainly isn't going to. And then I loved it when my competition started telling their story because I used to embarrass them. Because they could never tell a story as good as me, right? They come up with this, one call does it all. <laughs> they say one call does it all. What they mean is one call does it small. And I'd nail them. And they quit doing that. And I get letters from their attorney, but I didn't care. You can't say that unless you give us a disclaimer. Let's just sue me. I don't own a thing. I don't own a thing. It's all my wife's. And if you sue me, you've got to sue me in Iosco County, not where you live in Ann Arbor. And we've got to have a jury of my peers. <laughs> and Judge Ed Keller stood up for me at my wedding 10 years ago, so, you know, sue me. <laughs> and they quit, they quit threatening with that. I don't care. I've been threatened by the mafia and the Viet Cong. Little Caesar doesn't scare me a bit, man. <laughs> you will die, round die. <laughs> Skunk, we're going to be messy. You know, this, you know, sometimes it's messy doing this kind of work, but it happens all the time. I'm not saying be illegal. I'm just saying it's going to be messy. Know your enemy. I want to know everything about my competition. I want to know what kind of sauce and cheese they're using. I'm going to twist it on them. I want to know how they pay their employees. I want to know, I want to know all their stuff. And it's all there for the asking. You don't have to be a, you know, a CIA member to get a plan of what makes them successful or not. You have to do SWOT analysis on your competition. That stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's a SWOT analysis. I do one on myself. I do one on all my competitors. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Oh, my batteries are new. I don't get it. Know your limitations, like Schlitz. You can get too busy and blow it and drop customer service completely. That's why when with some of the, these things called a million-dollar letter that Kevin Carrington wrote in the Black Book, I never recommend you mail more than about $500 at a time. Because I had a customer mail out, I had a client of mine mail out 20,000 of them in Pittsburgh, and he had about a 21% return. Yeah, he was gone. You know, he was crazy, couldn't handle it. So you mail out 500 at a time, and you get a 15, 20% return. You can handle an extra 50, 60, 70 pies. You can't ha handle an extra two, 300. So, you know, you can get so busy where you, good marketing, can, you know, if it's too good, it can hurt you. So you got to pace yourself. <clears throat> Do a SWOT analysis on yourself. You know, you've got weaknesses. I did. Those are the things you hide. You expose your competitors' weaknesses, you hide your weaknesses, and you hope they don't expose your weaknesses. Never pick a battle you can't win. Now, I picked up, I, I, I fought the big guys with deep pockets with lots of money, Little Caesars and Domino's and a couple of independents. They had some serious, serious money. And I had to pick the right battles that I could win and not lose. And one of them was like 29-minute guarantee. I knew I could, I could do that. 
I proved it for three weeks before we, we launched it. And then I went one step further. We bought one of those $26,000 pickup trucks with a propane on it. You see those fancy things at Pizza Expo with, you know, it's a rolling, rolling pizzeria, basically? We called that our Pizza Express truck. And then we had a two-way radio from that truck to our dispatch area where our, our phones line all came in with a radio. And we had something called Pizza Express Pizzas. We had three pizzas, a pepperoni, a pepperoni ham mushroom, and a house special. I think it was nine bucks, 10 bucks, 11 bucks. They were on the truck, one size only. Call, we dispatch the truck to you. The pizza will be to your house in less than 20 minutes or the next one's half off. <coughs> so they call up, they want a Pizza Express, and number two, dispatch to express truck, your location. I'm at the base library, okay, you have an express number two going to them, and the guy's on the way. Five minutes later, he's making the transaction. Fast pizza, and they would hold about 45, 50 minutes in this, in this heated, you know, propane-type environment with steam in it. And we had some two-minute deliveries. We had 30-second deliveries. We, had, we got to be the talk of the town because we were so fast. Meanwhile, Domino's is going, well, we lost that unique selling proposition. He's faster, and he's, plus he's got this truck. So what people would do is they try to gang up on me on the Pizza Express truck. Can you imagine working in an office and say, okay, everybody's going to get pizza tonight, big days at 5.15. And we live north, south, east, and west of town. We're all going to call in at 5.15. He's only got one truck. And it's got a haul on it. He can't make it. So some of us are going to get half off pizza, right? Let's, let's give it a shot. Well, that never kept me with my pants down, right? I got a Pizza Express going five miles south for, you know, northwest. I, uh, so what I used to do is make a couple Pizza Expresses and keep them on top of the oven. So when all those people ganged up on me and called me, I'd say, you just became a delivery boy. Take this one pizza that way. You just go that way. And we got there less than 20 minutes, and they gave it up. But, you know, our people were cross trains so they could make it, bake it, and take it in a pinch. And it took the pressure off the truck, but it was a cool thing. So, you know, pick their best shot and see if you can beat them if they can Beat them at their own game. Be first at something. What are you guys first at in your town? Y'all first at something? If you read my notes, you know what my next question is. The next question is, who was the first person to fly across the Atlantic solo? Can I get his name, please? First person to fly an airplane across the Atlantic with solo. What was his name? Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. What was the name of his plane? Right. Where's the Spirit of St. Louis? Air and Space Museum. Smithsonian. <laughs> Who's the second man to fly across the Atlantic solo? <laughs> Who on? Me. Bert Hinkler. One week, lo one week later, faster for less money. Where's Bert Hinkler's plane? The landfill, right? People remember first. The first man to step on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Who was the second? Doesn't matter. First man to run a four-minute mile was Roger Bannister. Couldn't possibly be run by a human being. Who was the second man to do it? Doesn't matter. Pick something to be first in your town and be there. Because once you get there and you publicize it over and over, people will remember it. Who's your first kiss? You can all remember. Who's your second? It don't matter. <laughs> right? <laughs> Diane Tacolino. You can fill in your own name. It doesn't matter. You see, get something to be first at. That's a great, powerful marketing thing. So we were first at like seven or eight things. My competition couldn't touch it. Be proactive. You know, don't wait till your competition attacks. Figure out that plan on paper and start and start stick. Make them be on the defensive instead of on the offensive so they, march, they don't march over you. And a strong offense is better than any defense. So I used to have to make my, my competition had to wonder about what crazy ass Dave's going to do this month. That's a good position to be in, right? It beats the other way around, doesn't it? They had to wonder about me. I didn't have to worry, I didn't have to worry about them because I was always out there proactive on them. And I knew exactly what they could do. If you study the change, you know what their best shot is, don't you? And their moderate shot and their, lo and their, and their, their no shot. You can study that. It's very simple. The worst case scenario, the worst they can do to me is to offer this particular offer. And when they do, I'll be right there. And they did. Because it got to be so dicey in my town, they had to give their best shot. Because they weren't, they weren't coming in and crushing me. 
And they come out with worse, you know, ugly, ugly, ugly coupons. So what are you going to do with an ugly, ugly, ugly coupon person? <coughs> you know what I do? Meet them at their own, beat them at their own game, right? So how do you beat this person who's constantly slamming you with cheap pizza? You allow them to become your printing press. You accept their coupons. Take them for a couple months. Because their, their, their revenue is going down. Your revenue is going up. Your food cost is going to go up. But what's better? High, what's worse? Higher food cost or no, no sales? And not the whole picture. Not all your sales will be on discount anyway. Only a percentage will be on those people that are switching because of money. I'd rather have that 12 bucks in my register than his register. I don't care if it's 45% food cost. I never got complimented once in 35 years on my food cost from my banker. Never. You ever been complimented on your food cost? What do you care about? Right? Bottom line money. So we're all fixated. We're all anal about 32, 31, 28. <coughs> it's all contribution margin for transaction. That's the thing. It's called gross profit for, n for sale. And we got to have sales to create gross profit. And I'll work at a different margin as long as I have all the business. So we took the coupons. And I used to mail them back to the managers because we saved every one of them. <laughs> On their birthday with a Hallmark card. UPS, big box, full, taped up. <sighs> Happy birthday. Love you lots. Have a great year. Big day. And they'd open it up and be all their coupons for a whole year. Because you're messing with somebody in the head. You got them, don't you? If you mess with them in their checkbook at the same time you're messing with their head, you double got them, right? So I used to keep them off balance. Hallmark card, though. Make sure you give the very best because you don't want to be, you know, cheap safe. Try some new stuff. In this book, you're going to see some new stuff. Some are bomb. Some will be brilliant. And then measure return on investment. And if you'll turn to me, to page real quickly here, we're going to wrap this up real quick. This, this little ditty that I did here on page number 26. You'll find page 26 and 27. This little strategy, if you read this in the next day or so and try to implement it, this, this little coupon right here, that employee bounce back certificate brought me a $90,000 worth of new sales. If you turn the page, you're going to see what it cost me to do the whole, the whole promotion called the math. Do you need a book? You got one or you need one? Need for ninety thousand dollars, I had to spend uh, about four hundred bucks. Would anybody spend four hundred bucks to get ninety thousand in? You can't do it with a commission salesperson. We've already decided that, right? You have to actually go out and do the thing. But this will take you about oh four or five minutes to read. You'll have two or three questions that I didn't answer, but they're pretty much answered in here how we did it. But what I wanted to do was basically have my employees bring me in brand new customers, not existing customers, but brand new. And what you'll see is when I handed out these cards for my employees to hand them out to their non-customer friends to come in for a half-off pizza, when I honored that, that, that discount card and I sold you a $14 pizza for 7 bucks, did I make any money on that transaction? No. Did I lose any money on it? No. I broke even, right? I covered food and labor on the half, right? Pretty close. But I got you in for the first time. Maybe the first time in six months because you quit coming because our prices went up. For some real weird reason, we don't care. I want you to come in. So I handed out all my employees about 10 cards, and I said, we're going to have a contest, and we want you to go out and hand out these coupons to all your friends that don't order pizzas here. You sign your name, you sign their name, and we're going to keep track of these things. And would you do that for me? Because we need to have sales go up or else I'm going to be hurting puppy, and I can't give you any raises. You know what their, you know what their general attitude is, right? big deal. Do they really care? Until I said, guess what? It's so easy to track because when these cards come in, your name will be on them. We're going to put them in piles. And at the end of 30 days, the person with the big pile gets a brand new $100 bill. They went, what? Repeat that again. <laughs> so I just told them. The $100 bill is going in the office, and the person who has the most of these cards returned in 30 days gets this $100 bill. They smell so good. They feel so good. They sound so good. You've got a place for a $100 bill. Everybody does. 
Well, all of a sudden, I answered that favorite question of theirs, and that's going to be, y'all got a pen with you? Hold your pen up, would you? Hold it right up here in the sky. Every one of our employees has their favorite radio station. You got, they, you know what it is, because when they're, when they're rocking and rolling and cleaning up, it's M&M, it ain't ours, right? <laughs> and ours is different. Put your pen right here, please. No one will laugh. No one's going to care. That's their radio antenna. That is their antenna. And unless it's coming in on their frequency, and that's W-I-I-F-M, they don't hear it. And that stands for what's in it for me. And if you tell them, what, get it up, get it up, but you're not relieved. What's in it for me, they're going to pay attention to me. But no, we're the boss. And we have our own radio station. It's an oldie station called WGDFM. What you're going to do for me, what you're going to do for me, what you... And they don't hear that shit, because it's not on the same one. But as soon as you wave the money or make it worth their while, what's in it for me, you got some buy-on, don't you? Well, this thing could have bombed, and it should have bombed, until I busted out the $100 bill. And a long story, when you flip over and see the math, we had 357 cards returned in 30 days. So we made 357 pizzas for 357 families that hadn't been in our store in at least six weeks or never been in our store. And then we tracked those people, because on the back of the card, we asked them to write their name, address, and phone number. We created our own mini mailing list on this. And we tracked them for about six, eight weeks. My manager had the dubious honor of doing that every day, and it burned them out, but I wanted to track it. And at the end of six, eight weeks, we had 185 of those people return more than four times in six weeks. Do the math, 90 grand. So if I loaded that gun and said, can you go get a customer? Yeah, you can get a customer. You got to think about it. You got to do a little, you know, out of the box stuff with your employees and make them, you know, pay a little money. But I'd rather pay my money to employees and give half off to complete strangers to get them to come in and try me because marketing is nothing more than first dates. You're making first dates with people, so you got to be uh, looking your very best. You know, instead of you wearing these blowing out sneakers and blowing out jeans and blowing, you got to look your best. You got to spend another 30 seconds. You know, I don't have much hair anymore, but one day, not long ago, I was a, you know, styling out guy. But you got to look your best when you're making your first dates. That's why we kind of lower our guard sometimes. And that's why our competition comes in with a higher bar to jump over, and we don't, we don't jump along with them. We're still back in the 80s and 90s. <coughs> measure, measure your ROI, return on investment on your, on your marketing. And, you know, yellow pages. You ever measure your ROI on yellow pages? But you keep on writing that $500 a month check, don't you? $300 a month check, whatever it is. <coughs> can't measure it, shouldn't be writing it. So put a blind phone number in there the next time they come in. And the phone company will put a counter on that. You know how they have fax counters and all that stuff? Put it on your fax line. So the number in the phone book is your fax number. No big deal, is it? Phone rings, you pick it up, you answer the phone. And that fax machine will keep track of how many incoming calls you had. And if you're not getting 10 incoming calls a day, you better look over your yellow page ad because that's the only place they can get that number, right? It's not on your menus, as you know, it's going to be for motels, it's going to be for people that are just looking for the first place to buy a pizza, and they're going to go to the yellow page instead of, you know, they already kind of know if they've been in your town more than a year where they're getting pizza from. They don't need to go to the yellow pages and look it up. Occasionally they do, but no, we'll keep on writing 10,000, 5,000 a year to yellow pages and having that much return on investment, because I've tracked it. Go back home and open up Pizza Hut's ad and see what they advertise like in the, in the yellow pages. You know how big their ad is? Go look. Because they do it differently. They, they spend that 10000 in areas that's going to bring them 50000 in instead of maybe two sales a day or three sales a day with the occasional traveler or business person or new person to town that looks up their number. Measure the uh, return on investment. When you get a cool thing, tweak it and run it again. Because the first time I did this wasn't perfect. But the third time I did it, I had it nailed. Because the second time I worked it, we didn't have much customer employee buy-in. First time, gangbusters, right? But the third time we ran that employee bounce-back coupon, I come back from a road trip. I said, hey, Joe, I got them all geeked up at the last meeting. How many uh, coupons did we get in this week? He said, four. I said, four. Four? I said, four. So what's wrong? What's wrong? 
said, well, you know, three years ago, that 100 bucks was a big deal. It ain't no big deal anymore. You didn't raise a bar. I said, well, how do I get these people jazzed up so they go out and do it like they did last year? He says, well, and that's where I love a good manager to tell you the truth. Britney Spears is going to be down at Saginaw Civic Center in about two, three, four weeks. Let me buy some tickets. That'll get their attention. Remember? Remember? And you know that Mountain Dew clock that Pepsi gave you, that ugly neon thing that you refused to put out in the dining room? It's nasty. Every employee has come to me and begged for that clock. And I've got to tell them no because if I give it to one person, I'm going to make 15 angry. Let's throw that in the deal. Cool. So we just redid the grand prize. We get 100 bucks cash plus Britney Spears tickets plus the ugly Mountain Dew clock. <laughs> Boom! Explosion because we got their attention. What's in it for me? So you got to kind of tweak your things. What worked one year might not work the same exactly the second year. Analyze it and figure out what's going to take to get it over. Create wow in your ads and spots. Some spots, man, are pretty lame. I, I, I'll not talk about that much more, but they got to be memorable. When you come across with a headline, and you come across with a headline to the ad to the ad, it better have some wow to it. And if it doesn't, go back and rewrite it. And if it doesn't, don't even do it. Don't waste your money because people are drawn into headlines. You know, let's look at the ultimate pizza guarantee. You guys, find that in the book. The ultimate pizza guarantee. I don't know what page it's on. Oh, there it is. Page number uh, 17. This is printed on everything that we dispersed out of my building. Every piece of paper that went out had this guarantee on it. Go ahead and read it silently and then tell me whether or not it's an impressive statement or not. You already guarantee your pizza, right? What's wrong with guaranteeing your competitions? Is your pizza better than your competitions? Absolutely, right? Wouldn't it be cool if somebody bought a pizza from your competition they weren't totally happy with and they said, I got a snatty pizza from your competition. Let me do the Nordstrom thing. I'm going to take care of it. Whoa, stop. Don't eat it. I'm going to make you the identical pizza and bring it over to your house. Just give me the uneaten portion. Would that be cool? Because people are going to talk about that. And it's going to cost you, what, 3 or $4 hours the cost of that pie to replace that ugly pie? But people are going to talk about that. And you'll see on the bottom we have a disclaimer, only one time per address, so you can't get the guy honking you week after week after week. But if you got good pizza, and you know it's better than your competition, you, you, you subtly guarantee it anyway. Why not tell the whole world? Best pizza in Oscoda, guaranteed. In fact, we guarantee all the competitors. Scared to death. Scared my competition to death we came out with that. Because how are you going to beat it? Because I know they're screwing up 3%. Just like me, they're human. They're messing up with human errors, and I just want to be there and just get those customers one at a time, two at a time, one at a time, real slow, and eventually they're gone. So that's something when I'm saying, wow, do something with some guts to it. Don't do this namsy pamsy. We're cheap, we're good, eat me. That just doesn't cut it anymore. <laughs> that doesn't cut it. Invite your customers to play. The first one in here when you get back after lunch, if you want to read one called Customer Appreciation Night, this is a prime one on how to get your crew and customers to play in a, in a marketing thing. And the last one is just have some fun. Man, you got to love this business or you should be bailing on it, right? you got to love it. It's in your blood. You know you love it. Have some fun with marketing. It is great when it, when it works. It's just fantastic. And we used to, you know, have things like the Big Day Marching Kazoo Band. Every employee had a pocket in their, in their apron, and every pocket had a kazoo. And after every time we hit 2000 bucks, we took the phones off the, off the walls for about, about five minutes, and we all got our kazoos, and we hammered out our kazoo song for the night. <laughs> and we hit another 1000 we we'd, we'd march around the building and do a little uh, Mardi Gras thing. You know, have some fun because it's a pressure cooker. We're living under a lot of stress. And, man, you got to, you know, have, just have some fun with your crew and, and with you and keep it clean and keep it, you know, sober and all that stuff. But, you know, we were, we marched in the, in the Walk America. 
the big day, marching kazoo band, marched and you know, we led the parade with my big mascot pizza dude, that big seven foot slice, with the cop cars and the lights and sirens and all that. Just have some fun. <sighs> Marketing is the only expense that brings in new customers and more sales. No other expense line item does that. It's thrilling when a strategy works and you get old customers coming back. Maybe people you lost, maybe a year or two, you haven't seen them, they start coming back. And that's where that bounce back thing. Your enthusiasm is going to run off on your help. And if it doesn't rub off on your help, then start thinking about replacing that person. Because I want people like Nordstrom people that when somebody comes in and grandma's slamming and having a bad hizzy about these tires, they'll just take care of those customers. They're going to do the right thing. Yeah, it's going to cost you a little bit here, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. And that's how you import. This person who gave away the tire, tires was like honored. If I have a, uh, a driver come back and say, Dave, I had to comp Mr. Smith his entire order. We promised him 45 minutes. We were there in an hour and five. You know, it was one of those things. He was mad. Wife already had to take the kids, you know, and he's, he's you know, we've all had that, right? I comped him the whole order. And then I also made sure that he got a goof on for his next order because I want to save this guy. He comes back every week for years. And I would publicly praise that guy right in front of all the employees and pull a 20 out and give it to him out of my pocket. Most of you people won't do that. Number one, you're going to be pissed because they dropped the order, and it was an hour and 15 minutes. Number two, you're going to hold the driver accountable because, you know, it's a problem, problem, but he did the right thing for that customer at that moment of time. Mr. Smith was unhappy, totally freaking. He gave him the food, and he gave him next time for free. So I rewarded this guy in front of 20 people with a $20 bill. But you did the right thing. When you start rewarding people in front of all their peers and letting them know that it's okay to do what he did, because the customer is the only reason we're here, it starts to get repeated. Because kids don't want to be answering to their friends and peers of being the only geek, geek in the group. They want to fit in, don't they? Kids do. But if you've got a whole crew full of cool geeks, everybody fits in. If you get people that are criticizing their peers for, why'd you help that little old lady out to her car with those pizzas? <laughs> you know? Because it was the right thing to do. You know, when you get that whole crew thinking doing the right thing to do, then it becomes so cool. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And you have to reinforce that and thank those people for doing it. We had a party the day Little Caesars closed. And <laughs> Domino's. I mean, it was a barbecue. Big party. We earned it. We deserved it. I brought back my retards that worked for me three, four, five years ago. Come on over to my place. We're having a big barbecue. It's called the Domino's Bites the Dust Party. You know what I mean? We had a party. Because they'd have a party if they drove me out of business. Down in Ann Arbor, they would. But I got to tell you, in 25 years, when I had my store, and those two biggies came in, along with the other ones, and we started slamming heads and butting it out, and one fell off, and one went right down in the pits. I sold my restaurant three years ago, and guess what happened a month or two after I sold my restaurant? Chains came back to town. And they told me quite publicly, quietly off the record, you whipped our butt first time we came. We wouldn't come back when you're still there. Now that you've sold, we're coming back. Which I think is an, a compliment. What are they, what's your competition saying about you? Something good, something bad, or nothing, right? Um, we're not going to sell any food costs, pro. Bill and I are going to be here for the next two, three hours. We're going to be right after lunch break. We're going to go into that big room where they have all the vendors set up, so we'd love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions. Otherwise, the cost of this $10 book is to make out the speaker eval on the front and drop it on a table on the way out of here. I'll see you out at lunch. It'll take you 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.